Good morning, everyone. Um, if this is Friday, it must be Melbourne. <laughs> As I've been traveling around the country, and I wake up in the morning and say, okay, now where am I at today? <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, share some uh, thoughts about work that we've been doing on trying to understand is how uh, evidence-based practices can be uh, used by early childhood practitioners as well as parents and what professional development specialists need to do and need to understand in order to be able to support and encourage practitioner and parent use of uh, evidence-based practices. Okay, why is it not working? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start out by uh, pointing out two lessons learned as a result of the work that we recently been doing. Um, the first one is, is that uh, no evidence-based early intervention practice, no matter what its evidence base is, is likely to be adopted and used by either parents or practitioners if the implementation methods, uh, meaning the professional development itself is not evidence-based. In other words, is that, is that I could have the best evidence-based practices on the face of the earth is but if I'm not using the correct uh, and most effective professional development practices there's a low probability that parents or practitioners will use evidence-based intervention practices um, and a second lesson learned and I'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about this is that um, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink is that the the parent or practitioner who you're working with has to value the practice that you're asking them to use because if they don't see the value of the practice is they're unlikely to uh, either implement it at all or continue to use the practice uh, once it is, is taught. So I'll start by talking about the difference between two types of practices. It's a, it's a framework that has evolved from a relatively new field called implementation science. And in implementation science, they make a distinction between what I would call intervention practices, which include any of the methods and procedures uh, that are used by intervention agents. And I've just listed some of them. That's not all of them. Teachers, therapists, clinicians, parents, uh, to affect changes or produce desired outcomes in some target group. Uh, or audience. And implementation practices include the methods and procedures that professional development specialists use is to promote interventionist um, use of evidence-based intervention practices. Okay. And um, this is the way in which we think things are related. If, if I'm working with a group of practitioners or parents, and I'm using evidence-based implementation practices to promote their use of evidence-based intervention practices, we ought to see changes in whatever outcomes are the focus of the intervention. It could be parent outcomes, family outcomes, or uh, child outcomes. And what I've done here is simply listed some of the different um, implementation and intervention practices that my colleagues and I have been been looking at. These are not the only ones. And so um, in terms of implementation practices, we've, we've developed a procedure called PALS, Participatory Adult Learning Strategy. But there's other, there's other uh, implementation methods, um, coaching, just-in-time training, and so forth. And then I've listed some of the intervention practices that we've looked at in terms of First of all, identifying the evidence base for the practices and then um, developing evidence-based intervention practices. And the, these are just some of the outcomes that have been the focus of our work. Now, there's an interesting piece of this that is a little bit different than the way most um, researchers have thought about evidence-based practices. Um, my colleagues and I simply think that any, any intervention practice or implementation practice can be uh, thought of as made up of different components and elements. 
And it's those components or elements which we call characteristics uh, are the factors that are associated with outcomes of interest. And so, for example, one of the things that we spend time doing is looking at the relationship between the characteristics of different types of implementation practices and how they're associated with parent or practitioner use of the characteristics of evidence-based intervention practices and then uh, look at the outcomes associated with them. Now, um, for those of you who know about or are interested in the evidence-based movement, there's all kinds of different frameworks. This happens to be one that I used in a chapter to try to illustrate that traditional ways of thinking about evidence-based practice are not very useful in terms of, of helping a parent or practitioner know what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, Marley um, defines uh, the three types of evidence-based practices as efficiency, effectiveness, uh, efficacy, effectiveness and uh, efficiency. But one of, the, one of the things that we learned a long time ago is that you can do all these things, but they are not very helpful for day-to-day -day practice. That, and they're, they're all important and they're necessary, but they're not very useful. So for example, in terms of the last one, efficiency, is the extent to which an intervention is worth its cost to individuals or society, is that that, uh, my experience has been is that when you try to take a intervention that was investigated under controlled conditions and ask a parent or practitioner to do those uh, as part of everyday life is that most people basically say it, it's just too much trouble or it's too much to ask me and so people make these judgments about you know is it worth my effort is it is it uh, more trouble than it's worth and so uh, we, we know from for example, our efforts to scale up um, different types of early literacy learning practices is by the time you get down to the practitioners and parents, um, they, they oftentimes just don't see how they can possibly fit it in to what they're doing. And so we've kind of shifted the focus. And so we've, we've developed a procedure that uh, we call practice-based research syntheses, and I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail about this, is but what we try to do when we look at um, an intervention and the ways in which it was investigated, what either under control conditions or naturalistic conditions, is we try to unpack, disentangle, and un unbundle the practices to isolate which characteristics of all the characteristics that were used that matter most in terms of explaining the outcomes that were the focus of investigation. Is, is, is a simple way of thinking about it is I, I as a researcher might say there's 10 things that are absolutely important about a particular practice. But when we look at all the studies that have been done on that practice, we find that only four of the 10 things are really what matters most. And then what we do is we take the four things that matter most and use that to develop evidence-based uh, practices. And so it's a different way of thinking about things. Um, sometimes not very popular with my colleagues, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so we, based on our uh, practice-based research syntheses, we define evidence-based practices as practices informed by research f findings demonstrating, and there's lots of different ways you can demonstrate the relationship between the characteristics and consequences of a practice. And these can actually be planned intervention or national, naturally occurring interventions. And so, so for example, is it in a, um, research reviews that we've done on parent-child lap games, the, the, the games that parents usually play with their young infants, which have not been studied under controlled conditions, you can still isolate the characteristics of the games that seem to matter most in terms of explaining the fact that it promotes and enhances child social behavior, vocal behavior, and so forth. The, the important part of this, this uh, definition is, is that um, establishing the relationship ought to directly inform what a parent or practitioner can do to promote and enhance uh, child 
um, learning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through two examples real quickly just to illustrate how we go through the process of taking studies that were done for different purposes and then reanalyzing all the studies to figure out is whether or not we can isolate the characteristics that matter most. And I'll do an implementation practice and intervention practice. Okay, so the, uh, the research synthesis I'm going to use was uh, of um, 58. They, tur they turned out to be randomized control design studies just because there were so many of them. Um, and there were different types of adult learning methods that were used to produce changes in adult learner outcomes. And they accelerated learning coaching, got, got it designed in just-in-time training. I won't, I'm not going to talk about each of those se separately, other than to say some of them have some common elements and some of them have elements that are unique to the individual approaches. There was a, there was a little over 2,000 um, participants in the experimental groups and 2,000 uh, participants in the comparison or control groups. They were a combination of studies in university and non-university settings. And um, the studies that were done in non-university settings were all done in the context of uh, people's work environments. And, and I'll just set, mention this quickly and talk about it a little bit later, is uh, promoting uh, the use of evidence-based practices in real life situations is much more effective than doing it in um, non-work settings like workshops. <laughs> okay, the learner outcomes included uh, a whole series of different things that we organized into learner knowledge, practices, skills, attitudes, and self-efficacy beliefs. Um, and then the influence of the, the adult learning methods on the learner outcomes were estimated using a, a procedure, a method called Cohen's D effect size, which is how big the difference is between the uh, observed changes in experimental and control group, groups. Now, um, okay, this is, this is how we went about unpacking the uh, methods. None, nobody in the original studies did any of this. Uh, at the time we were uh, doing this research review, a book called How People Learn was published, and the whole focus of the book was on the characteristics of the learning experiences to let, let children, adolescents, and adults become expert learners in some aspect of their life. And uh, what, what the uh, um, editors of the book did, they, they, they basically said that when people engage in uh, learning experiences that are designed to enhance or promote uh, their ability to have deep understanding of something, is that um, most expert learners go, go through a process of planning, trying it out, application, and then engaging in reflection on what they did and what happened as a result of it. Well, when we when we um, looked at the findings from that research review, we noticed that each of those three big categories actually had a couple of subcategories in them, and and uh, and so we divided them up in terms of what methods and procedures were used to introduce a practice, illustrate the use of the practice, have the learner uh, use the practice, have the learner evaluate his or her experience in using the practice. Is uh, me as the um, coach or professional development specialist facilitating learner reflection and assessment of mastery of the practice. And so what we did, we went through every one of the studies took us over a year to do this, <laughs> is, and then uh, identified all the different practices that were done uh, in each of those uh, six subcategories. And I, if, if I remember correctly, is that we identified um, over 200 different types of things that people did uh, across those six subcategories, and we wound up is categorizing them into, I believe, 36 uh, different uh, types of practices that were used. And so what I'm going to show you is the particular practices that were associated with uh, optimal learner outcomes. So of the 36, the ones that mattered most, 
where uh, these particular practices is uh, the learners engaging in some type of out of class or out of workshop learner activities or self instruction before I introduced the practice to the learner. Um, some type of classroom or workshop presentation and then some type of pre-class learning experience. So for example, is a couple of years ago as part of a summer class I teach every two or three years at the University of British Columbia is I, I, used, I used this kind of framework for um, teaching the class rather than getting up and lecturing for four hours every day for two weeks in a row. And, uh, and so at the end of each class, I, I had all of the students um, get an assignment to do a pre-class um, learner experience before the next class. And the whole beginning of the next class was devoted to them sharing their experiences and me using their experiences to illustrate the fact that the practices that were the focus of the class were characterized by certain features. And then, um, me, me doing role playing or simulations, uh, learner informed input, for example. You know, could any of you give me an example of how you use this practice in your work with uh, uh, young children and their parents? Uh, I'll, I'll point out a couple of things. The first, first thing is, is that the introduction is what I do as the professional development specialist. The um, um, introduction and illustrate Practicing and evaluation is what the learner does, and reflection and mastery is what I and the learner do together. Is uh, if you look at those numbers, you'll notice that as you go down the list, the more the learner is involved in their own learning, the larger the differences between the control and uh, experimental groups. Um, and the lesson learned from that is is that is involved involve the learner as much as possible in every aspect of the learning experience if you want to get optimal effects. Okay, so the ne next thing we did, we basically said, okay, now uh, taking inter introduction, did, did the study use any of those three practices? And if they used one of the three practices, they got a score of one. If, if they use either of the two illustration practices, they also got a score of one. And so you go down, so you could, potentially get a score from zero to six. And so we asked the question, uh, what's the relationship between the number of characteristics that are used and learner outcomes? And lo and behold, is that the more of the characteristics that are incorporated into the lear learner's experiences, the larger the benefits to the learner. And so uh, one of the things we know from related work is that most of the things that are at the bottom of the list in terms of uh, learner evaluation, reflection, and mastery are hardly ever incorporated into professional development for early childhood practitioners, which is probably the reason why it takes so long to get some practitioners to learn to use evidence-based practices. A couple other things. Um, training provided to a small number of learners which much more effective than training provided to a large number of learners. And so for example, when we, when Carol Trivett, my colleagues and, uh, colleague and I, uh, are asked to te teach people how to do this, to work with practitioners, is we, uh, ab we uh, absolutely limit the number of people to 12. And we prefer less than that. Because it, the smaller the number of learners, the easier it is to engage all the learners in a learning process uh, as, as, as part of whatever training we're being provided. Uh, training provided on multiple occasions over a period of time, generally spread out over about 10 weeks or so, that includes more than 10 hours, was much more effective than one-time training. Um, and so, and we actually, we actually have been doing that for some time where we distribute the learning opportunities over time to give people a chance to process the learning experiences and have the opportunity to use the experiences. And then training provided in the context of real life application was much more effective than outside non-contextual learning experiences. And so for example, I would challenge everyone in the room to remember back to your 
undergraduate and university training and tell me what was the second class you took in your second semester of school and what you learned. <laughs> 